I think the next speaker, Elizabeth Lingren, will also <laughs> give us some of those. Uh, Elizabeth is a medical doctor to start off with, but who has for many years worked transdisciplinary with issues of climate change and human health. Um, you say that you see yourself as a bridger between science and policy, and you have also served as a senior advisor for the World Health Organization and for several different e EU agencies. And uh, you are also active, as Dr. Shin, in the IPCC and others here at, in the IPCC progress, process. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me to, to be here today and give a speech on something that's normally forgotten about when we're talking about global environmental change and changes of the planet. We forget that we are actually biological beings and we are also affected as well as the natural environment, as biological and also as social beings. And my talk today will focus on climate change and health, what that really is about and what we can do about it. So when we're looking at climate change and health, we have to understand that we have the global scale, but we also have the local scale. And what is happening at the local scale depends on local conditions, the vulnerabilities, the resilience, and the adaptive capacity of the society to try to counteract possible effects that are being identified by impact assessment and risk analysis. Climate change normally in regard to health and also in, in regard to other impacts doesn't create new problems. It actually often enhances existing problems, like in increasing problems in disaster-prone areas, where people normally also are getting more, and the population densities are getting more dense. And that means that often climate change doesn't create new problems, and it doesn't work by itself. It's often actually interlinking with other key drivers, like population uh, drivers, like land use changes, or our increasing interconnectedness with the rapid travel and trade that are actually spreading, as we heard um, being mentioned earlier, the, uh, pathogens and vectors, insects, disease transmitting insects around the globe. And then if they arrive in, a, in an area where climate change in the future will have changed the climatic conditions, these insects or these pathogens or these animals can actually come to become established in, in new areas. So that is one of the drivers. And the mechanisms behind climate change and health impacts are both direct and indirect. This is a diagram made by Professor Tony McMichael from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine now in Australia, who is one of the main pioneers within the field of climate change and human health. And you have the direct effects over here, where you, you die from a disaster, you drown or you're being uh, hit by the heat wave, for example. But you also have the indirect effects, which is more complicated to understand, where we have a lot of intermediate processes. And there, the effect on the climate change is actually on the natural environment, on the built environment, our infrastructure, economic productivity, or the physical environment. And this will mediate many processes that finally will have either an ec ecological mediated impacts or socially mediated. So it can be that we are changing the ecosystem and thereby uh, providing uh, new grounds for uh, vector-borne diseases, insect-borne diseases, or it can be that flooding and uh, temperature, for example, affecting water quality and water quantity and food production. So there are we need to understand those mechanisms when we are assessing what might happen in an area. If we just, I will just give you a very brief overview on what might happen, but if we look at one that we know uh, now uh, that we're going to get more intense and often more frequent uh, extreme weather events, and that may create floods and landstorms, uh, sorry, landslides, and also, as we have seen recently, all the storms that uh, are occurring worldwide. And unfortunately, many of the, in the low-income regions, many of the poor people are, are are living in disaster-prone areas, and they are getting more, so it's going to be more people affected 
by these extreme weather events. And of course, as we all know, we have injuries and death. We also have epidemics in the aftermath, not only by water quality and food quality that are being contaminated, but also that people are being exposed to insects and other vectors that are carrying diseases. We also have the effects on the built environment, and that also includes our industrial part of the world, uh, that the vital services of society, electricity is cut off, water supply is cut off. So that will be many, many long, long uh, period of time that these effects will co continue. We also have to, we don't forget the toxic leakages. Think about what happened in Japan, for example, uh, if the, um, an extreme weather event would uh, arrive in an area where we have industrial plants or nuclear plants. So we have to think about that as well. And of course, people living in both uh, areas where there's a risk of sea level rise, but also of the disaster um, uh, of extreme events, they will have a negative effect of livelihoods. And we might see that people are forced to move because of this. So we get this migration. Heat waves is something new also. We become more intense, hitting also the more Nordic countries. Up here, we are, it's not the outdoor temperatures that are of interest, it's the indoor temperatures, since our buildings are built for keeping out the cold, but not cooling off in, in, in summertime. Uh, heat is actually, is, especially in combination with air pollution, causes deaths, and it causes uh, increased morbidity. The particular people at risk are the elderly population and people with lung um, uh, problems and cardiovascular diseases. But also in tropical countries, when people when uh, people are forced to work outside, as in particular in the urban environments, uh, when the temperatures go up to up over 40 degrees, we see that this is really a problem in some regions. Uh, on top of this, in urban environment, we have the urban heat island effect. So in the city center, the temperature, the medium temperature, might be so much, much higher than out in the suburbs or out in the countryside. Uh, so the urban population we have to think about. But there are many, I will come back to that, there are many things we can do in order to counteract this. We had a um, heat wave in Russia about two years ago, in two, summer 2010. And at that time, there was a draft and a heat wave, and there was a lot of forest fires, wildfires, and creating this smog or, or this haze and, and um, uh, really blanketing the region. And our colleagues in Russia, they estimated that during that period of time, there was an excess of over 50,000 50, deaths that was attributional to this combination of air pollution and heat. We also had here in Europe in 2003, maybe some of you remember in France, there was a, like a wake up call for, for Europe that wow, we can also be hit by impacts of climate change because we had a heat wave uh, during summer 2003. And we have been calculated now and we estimate that about up to 40,000 people uh, died excessively, I mean, people normally die, but these, these people died that shouldn't have died unless we had had this combination of heat, but also air pollution. So it's a combination here. Don't forget we can get dust storms. Uh, climate change might in some areas where there are, especially if there have been land use changes like in China, uh, with more wind, we can get an increase in the problem with dust storms. Another major, and uh, Melissa touched on that, is the food security. Uh, water quality and quantity might be, hit, uh, be affected in some areas, and of course this will affect food security. And the people that are particularly vulnerable for this are the, the are local populations that are using rain-fed agriculture. But also the rice-producing countries, where they are, are currently the rice is very dependent on the changes between the monsoon season and the dry season. Uh, also very vulnerable, of course, uh, families and populations that are dependent on the food production, not only for livelihood, but also for the local um, consumption, their own consumption. And the health consequences, of course, is everything from death, malnutrition, 
but, and the children are in particular vulnerable here. We also have an effect on the immune system, so they become even more vulnerable to, to many infectious diseases like malaria and diarrheal diseases. And climate change have a tremendous impact on some of the, not all, but some of the infectious diseases. And once again, often in combination with other key drivers. We know that many of the parasites and, and pathogens are multiplying faster at high temperatures. And that goes for many of the water and foodborne diseases, but also for the vector-borne diseases. And the vector-borne disease, once again, a vector is an insect or a tick that are blood-sucking blood from an infected animal or human and transferring it to a human. And <clears throat> once that uh, insect or tick has become infected, if the temperatures are high, the, the virus or the bacteria might multiply faster within the insect or tick. Uh, what, also flooding, of course, might affect um, both vector-borne diseases and waterborne diseases. Uh, by creating either breeding grounds or contaminating water sources. What we are concerned about are changes in the current disease burden world in different parts of the world uh, and locally, and also about the new threats. And I will give you some examples from the very close neighborhood here. In, uh, at, in the Northern Hemisphere, at the in, in temperate zones, the main, and without doubt, the main problem on, in, in regard to vector-borne diseases is tick-borne diseases, because we still don't have that many insect-borne diseases. And tick-borne diseases, the main one is in, in US, you call it Lyme disease. In Europe, we call it Borreliosis or Lyme Borreliosis. And here in Europe, in Europe we also have tick-borne encephalitis. Uh, there have been observations on ticks in Sweden and in the Czech Republic, as well as Russia, since the 1950s. And so we have long period of data. And we did some um, studies here in Sweden on changes in the distribution limit, the latitude limit of ticks in the mid-1990s. And now we have another 15 years in data. And we can see what we found in the 1990s, that at that time, before the 1980s, many of the ticks, as well as many other uh, plants and, and species, uh, didn't go north of the, the, the river Dalälven. In the 1990s, they have started to move upwards here along the, Swedish, the Baltic coastline. And now we can actually find ticks all the way up here, all the way. And we can relate this change in latitude distribution with changes in seasonal climate, that the season for the tick activity have become longer and that the winters have become milder. At the same time, in Czech Republic, this fantastic data actually, I'm just so happy about that. They've been going to the same places in the Czech mountains since the 1950s and they can see, they've been checking that nothing happened until uh, the 90, 1990s. The ticks starting to be found higher up. And also many of these ticks contained the Borreliosis uh, bacteria and the tick-borne encephalitis virus. And now they have moved quite high up in the mountains. Same relation with seasonal uh, changes in weather and climate, climatic conditions. These uh, are, when we have this really good data, we can also do scenarios of the future. And these are scenarios on what will happen in the Nordic countries over the coming century in regard to tick establishment. And that doesn't mean that we will have the disease here, but this is a possibility of risk. We also have new threats, and I will give you an example. We got an introduction very recently here in Europe of tropical diseases. Chikungunya fever in 2007 and dengue fever in 2010. And this was caused by a combination of changes in climate uh, and local weather conditions and also uh, the international rapid travel and trade. We had in Italy in the summer 2007, it was very favorable weather conditions uh, for mosquitoes, and they were breeding and they were so abundant. And that particular mosquito came, was imported by mistake to Europe 20 years earlier uh, in a cargo with old um, tires that contained rainwater and the larvae of the mosquito. So that mosquito had established itself in Italy and France and was very abundant in Italy locally at that time. 
There was an Italian tourist going to India, got infected uh, in India with chikungunya virus, went back on the airplane, still infected, got bitten by Italian mosquitoes. And since the temperature were very high during that summer, the virus could replicate within the mosquito. And that single tourist case actually um, gave rise to more than 200 secondary cases that were laboratory confirmed and another 100 that were suspected. So we have to be aware of what might happen and also of surprises and new threats. And in order to do that, we need to do risk assessments of the future. We need to do impact assessment and adaptation assessment. And when we, in, in the climate community, when we, climate change community, when we are talking about adaptation, is, is prevention uh, on different things that will prevent a disease, for example. And when we're talking about mitigation, as you know, is how we can reduce the impact of, or how we can reduce emissions of um, greenhouse gases or the impact of the, um, of, of the greenhouse effect. And if we do nothing, we will have, as you see on the y-axis, this is the burden of disease. If we do nothing, we're going to get a lot of more health impacts, negative. We do have some positive, but they are not as, they are minority if you compare to the negative health impacts if we count the indirect effects. However, if we start mitigation here, we will advert some of the possible health impacts. But at the same time, we have to do this risk assessment and know what will happen at the local level so we can do some of the um, uh, uh, adaptation measures. For example, starting vaccination programs or building better disaster uh, preparedness re response systems like they have done in Bangladesh where they have actually uh, added the attributional effect of climate change uh, for the coming 50 years into that program of disaster preparedness. But we, sti we still have a health net, net, uh, health, net health impact. However, if we are very clever, we will choose methods here, met mitigation methods, that will also give a beneficial effect on health. And I will give you some examples on that. Because if we choose cleverly the methods, we can actually gain tremendously in positive health effects. And also, from a society point of view, that will economically be very, very good, very um, uh, valuable since the cost of health is huge for society in some cases. So, for example, if we decrease the use of fossil fuels in vehicles, we would reduce the level of air pollution. And of course, that would reduce the burden of disease on many of the respiratory, of lung, and cardiovascular effects, including heart heart um, attacks, um, stroke, etc. Increases in green spaces in urban environment is a new area that is focusing a lot, both in the industrial part of the world and the developing part of the world, to trap carbon. And that, of course, will have several positive effects. Number one, we will reduce the urban heat island effect, thus we will reduce the risk of deaths and sickness from heat. We will also the increase, there are many studies showing that there's an increase in well-being with people having green spaces within an urban environment, as well as people actually using the, or the green spaces and thereby getting more outdoor activities. We will also promote air quality. And finally, uh, by reducing um, black carbon emissions from um, solid biomass fuel stoves, we will have a lot of positive effects. In particular, the indoor cooking stoves that are used in many countries uh, in, in, all over the world. If we reduce or change that uh, into other type of um, uh, fuel uh, or um, uh, cooking stoves, we will reduce the indoor air pollution tremendously and thereby in increasing the health, in particular in women and children. We know, we know, for example, that today about two-thirds of the developing countries are using uh, cooking stoves that are biomass fueled. So this will all have big effects both on the, on the greenhouse gas effect as well as 
creating positive beneficial effects in, in regard if we look at the health in the public health in the, in the human population. And you can, I'm sure you can think of many other examples. So this is something we really should have in mind when we are thinking about how to mitigate uh, and avoid uh, many of the negative impacts of climate change. So I stop there.